In today's world, most of us are connected to social media, and this connection can be good or bad. Right. In the case of the North Bay fires and the Las Vegas mass shooting, people took to Facebook and Twitter to let their loved, one, loved ones know they were okay and also to share information on what happened. However, having constant access to news and images as well of tragic situations can overwhelm a lot of people, teenagers, children, even adults. For more on striking a balance on social media, we're joined live by Anna Homayoun, founder of Green Ivy Educational Consulting and author of Social Media Wellness, How to Help Children and Adults Thrive in an Unbalanced Digital World. Welcome. Congratulations on the book. Thank you for having me. Let's start with uh, times of crisis and social media right. and specifically the benefits. Right. Well, we know that social media really helps disseminate information and galvanize support in a way we never saw before. We had people finding each other housing and getting with supplies really quickly in ways we wouldn't have thought. You know, I, in my own house in San Francisco, woke mm -hmm. up on Sunday night and I was like, did I leave the oven on? And then I went on social media and realized it was the fires before I had heard it from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But we also had someone from either Napa or Sonoma County say that a little tiny piece of, in, of misinformation, the, the Castaneda Absolutely. Winery has burned down, right? right? That can spread forgive right. the pun, like wildfire, and be very right. damaging to Castaneda Winery. Right, absolutely. And this amplification of news and the quick way that it spreads is also part of the challenge, right? So I always talk about how the fact that social media isn't good or bad, but it's a new language that we have to understand. It's given us tools in ways we never have before, but at the same time, especially for teens and young adults, we don't know where to filter in and filter out information. A lot of times parents in the middle of the crisis didn't know what their kids were seeing online. That would be my biggest concern. I mean, I have parents of younger children, so they're not quite teens, but I kept thinking of all the thousands of individuals affected, you know, in the North Bay because of the fires. Folks who are just going back to school today right, right. Uh, for students, you know, that maybe it's just too much information out right. there at that point when they're trying to move on in this chapter of their life that is so difficult. And right. as a parent, I'd kind of want to be the gatekeeper of that. I want them to come to me first before sifting through all what's out there on their phones. Right, and with the idea of, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh graders getting smartphones, I always tell parents to understand they're getting the same no news notifications we are. And as adults, it's been very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So for kids who are younger, they don't have a way to process it. That's why that collaboration and those conversations are so important. But and how what is the answer though because you know we give our kids cell phones so that they can be connected so that right. we know where they are right uh, it, is the answer perf you know not letting them go on certain sites or uh, how do we, you know, do it? So there's a lot of ways to think about it. In a time of crisis, physical safety is of the utmost importance. So we want to start there. But the other thing with fifth, sixth, seventh graders is this idea of tiered access. They might need a phone for safety and convenience, right? But it might not need to be a smartphone and it might not need to have full access. There's so many different ways you can go on a phone and you can limit the sites kids go on. I mean, the Apple phone, if you go on the settings, it's very quick that you can just opt into certain things and and opt out of others. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I talk about in the book around healthy socialization, that we need to all know that we have a choice in how we spend our time online. In times of crisis, we don't feel like we have any choices. So thinking about what you can filter in or filter out for your kids is really important. Do you feel like parents need to step up? Because I know second graders who have mom's old phone in case of emergency. And I've talked to other parents that are in school who say, oh, I don't know that stuff. Oh, I get my son to explain it every time, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, you know, my, my husband has yeah. a phrase that I'll share with all. He says, be the parent. Totally. Be the parent. Totally. I mean, you can't hold, hand over mom's old iPhone. Mm -hmm. And be like, text me when you get to Susie's house without going so through everything else it brings. So to what you just said, that means you have to know yes. your phone. Yes. Yeah, you have to know your phone. And a lot of times, this idea of handing down the smartphone is actually really detrimental. Because giving a second grader access to a video and camera in their room, you you know, they don't have sort of the widespread life knowledge that we do of what's out there and where to filter and where to not. So we have to sort of be the gatekeepers. That's why I think about, when I think about phone use, it's this idea of tiered access, right? Right? So instead of giving the old iPhone, look at a flip phone or look at something that has messaging that can only go to certain kids. Mm -hmm. um, my high school students, I asked them this idea, when do you th think kids should get their first smartphone? High school seniors. And they were like, absolutely not before the eighth grade. They were 
-hmm. very thoughtful. Wow. And my office is in the heart of the Silicon Valley. They say so why? They, yeah, the they really why said they didn't think that up until the eighth grade you had the opportunity to think through your decisions mm -hmm. in a positive way. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, they, they were giving me ideas, I mean, and thoughtful claims. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, these are 12th graders. Mm -hmm. They really understand. And they were there not so long ago. Why right? did you do this? Why did you want to write this book? Well, I really realized that we as parents and educators don't speak the language of social media mm -hmm. and we need to, right? Our kids are online in a way they never have been before and this has quickly changed. You know, I started my company about 16 years ago and when I did, there was no social media, sure. but now it's everyone's number one distraction. Right. So in order to reach teens, I knew I needed to speak the language and once I did, I realized we need all adults to speak the language. Yeah. Kids want to talk about this stuff, right? They want to process what they're seeing online. And that's part of when they see a crisis like this, it's part of the conversation. I wonder if someone's going to make a device that, because the flip phone, I can already tell, you know, some kids are not going to want it. But something that Very looks cool. like this, but, uh, you know, your parent can actually control, yeah. you know, or some sort of control. So right. That I can keep my kid off of Twitter or whatever. Right, and there's a there's definitely a market for that. So we'll see what comes out next. Okay. Yeah. Meanwhile, the average teen spends nine hours online, not counting school right. and homework. Right. Keep that in mind. All right, Anna Homayun, thank you for joining Thanks us. Thank you for having me.